Thank you very much, Rosa Alexeyevna, and thank you very much for very hospitable welcome. You have very cozy, very warm atmosphere. Thank you for meeting and accepting us in a, such a wholehearted way. I just want to show you that I have a laboratory, but we don't call it a laboratory. We work. Uh, we name it collab. So it's collaboration. These are the members. Of my uh, research team, and we're doing a number of very interesting projects in Miami. Some of us came, have done uh, work in the past, and I'm going to tell you about one current project as an example um, of what we're studying. Okay. Now, if we can go back, if we can go back, uh, migration today, as you know, is unprecedented in, in scope. Uh, today there are over 240 million people who are migrants who are living outside of the country of their birth. Um, the country with the largest number of immigrants in the world is the United States. Uh, about 20% of the world's immigrants live in the United States. Uh, the second largest, uh, there's a competition most years between Germany and the Russian Federation. Um, and I don't know if that's a well-known fact, maybe to those of you who live here it is, but I know that in the rest of the world people don't think of Russia as a destination country, but it is. Um, and I know that this is a very important uh, problem for you here. So on average, uh, migrants tend to be younger. Um, and many, many of them are children who come with their families. Um, and included in the, pop, in the group that we think about when we think about immigration are also children of immigrants um, because they too are raised in immigrant households and only begin to interact with the culture, the surrounding culture when they go to school. Um, and I guess the other thing that I want to say, and, and I think that the, presenta the presentation right before is an example of this. Increasingly, immigrant communities are transnational in that uh, there are many languages spoken and people go back and forth between many countries. It used to be that with America anyway, people got on a ship and they sailed for many months and they arrived and then they never went back home. Today, of course, communication goes back and forth all the time. Uh, people um, go back and forth physically, they are in touch electronically, and this is a very important moment for us to understand transnationalism. I will say a few words about that later. And also, um, immigrant communities are heterolocal. What that means is that, uh, again, because of uh, electronics and, and so forth, people who live in a particular city they don't necessarily live in the same exact neighborhood, but they're still connected and there is an integrity to that community that surrounds them. So in the US, this is kind of the, the message that um, we're taught. Um, the idea of America as a refuge for many people coming from around the world. Um, and indeed, um, it is true, America provides refuge for, for many people fleeing terrible circumstances. But I also want to share with you kind of some of the reality of immigration, both in America and also everywhere, I think, because for the most part, people migrate from countries who are more poor to countries who are more rich. So this is a proverb, it's an old Italian proverb that I saw at Ellis Island in New York near the Statue of Liberty. And it says, I came to America because I heard that the streets were paved with gold. When I got here, I found out three things. First, the streets weren't paved with gold. Second, they weren't paved at all. And third, I was expected to pave them. And I think this very much is the reality uh, of, for most immigrants who come and that shapes the context within which the families live and the children are, grow up and are brought up. So I'm going to cover these six things in my talk today. Um, some conceptual issues and how we think about immigration, um, a bit about the context that immigrant students are entering, uh, 
who they are and the different types of immigrant students, what challenges they experience in adapting to school, what general approaches are used to addressing their needs, and I will give you an example of our current project uh, in Miami about immigrant students. So um, we are, are very fond in uh, child development and community psychology and education of this model by Yuri Bronfenbrenner, who was a Russian-born child psychologist who lived in the United States and developed this model of um, direct and indirect influences on the child. And people say he was inspired by Matryoshka dolls. I, I don't know if that's the case, but that image is used sometimes to describe um, the idea that it, the individual is at the center of a number of different systems. And to understand the child or the individual, it's less important to understand well, it's important to understand the genetics and so forth, but it is just as important to understand the, the different kinds of contexts. There's the immediate context of the family and the school. Um, there's a more distant context of policies in the societies and the macro system, which is the general culture. Um, and also, there's a very interesting piece of this, which, is, which Bronfenbrenner called the mesosystem, and that is the relationship between microsystems. So let me give you an example. So a particular child um, uh, operates within different microsystems, such as the home and the school. And the mesosystem involves the connection between parents and the school, even when the child is not there. And these are the kinds of influences that are important to understand in order to understand the child. I will give you a couple of examples. One is this idea of parent involvement. And part of the context that I think is very relevant for immigrants is the context within which they are viewed um, as having deficits, as being less than, as being um, somehow not um, uh, as good as, uh, we call, the de deficit model is the, the term that we use in the US as good as those who live in this country, the native born. So here is an, a research example that illustrates this. Um, there was a, a very large national educational longitudinal study in the US. Uh, they followed students for many, many years into adulthood. And the findings suggest that parent involvement in their children's schooling predicts academic achievement. They also found and they also were able to look at some immigrant groups, and they found that parents of Chinese immigrant students were the least involved in their children's schooling. The conclusion many of these studies reach is that parents of Chinese immigrant students should become more involved in school. It's, however, it is also the case that they're already achieving at least as well as, as the students of other, other parents. So this is an example of a deficit perspective on a group that is already doing well, and the idea that somehow the ways that they parent are not as good when in fact they're quite adequate and in fact sometimes better than those of the native born. Um, this is a paper that we did um, somewhat recently um, on culture brokering. So the, the phenomenon of culture brokering or language brokering is something that immigrant children often engage with. Um, and they translate on behalf of their parents. They uh, often translate in parent-teacher conferences, in my experience, because there's a lack of translators. Sometimes they're even asked to translate in medical settings. That is not very appropriate. And um, there's, a, there's a literature that suggests, and, and this is an example of literature that suggests that there are advantages to culture brokering and disadvantages. In the model that I showed you earlier, one thing I, I should say is that the idea is that individuals adapt to their environments, which means that there's no correct way to be. There's no best way to be. Just as evolution did not lead a, you know, us to a perfect condition, uh, we are adapted to our environment. And this creates a terrible dilemma in this work because if there's no correct way to structure things, then how do we know what, what to do and how to proceed? It's, it's, it's kind of unnerving, <laughs> but, but I'm afraid that's the case. And so this is an example where research shows that on one hand, 
culture brokering leads to negative outcomes for children. And on the other hand, there's some research that also suggests that children who culture broker and language broker, um, they, are, they have better self-esteem, their bilingualism is more uh, advanced, and they, they also have advantages. So we, we looked at a sample, a very large sample actually, of Russian, uh, Russian-speaking um, immigrants uh, in the United States. And we wanted to find out whether culture brokering was related to these outcomes. And in our model, what we found was, indeed, the more the child was involved in culture brokering, the more family disagreements they had, and as a result, uh, the greater the child's emotional distress. However, because we believe in the idea of looking at social ecology, we looked farther uh, along in, in the different levels. So we also looked at things like um, parents' social status in terms of um, their own uh, education and, and level. We looked at their language ability. And we also looked at community factors, such as um, we, look, we, we looked at census data um, to determine the type of neighborhoods that they lived in. Um, because uh, we wanted to understand the environment that they were in. In the U.S. now, and certainly in public health, for example, I don't know if this will translate, um, but they say that your zip code has more to do with the quality of your health than your genetic code. I don't know if that translates into Russian. Um, but where you live, the circumstances where you live, have more to do with your health um, than, than what you're born with, is what they say. So we looked at characteristics of the neighborhoods where they lived. Were they high status neighborhoods? Were they, were they high poverty neighborhoods? Uh, a lot of immigrants in these neighborhoods. And what we found was that the neighborhood that they lived in was related to their social status and the type of job that they had. Uh, as we expected, the, the less English the parents spoke, the more the children brokered. Um, the, but also, the worse their job was, the more children brokered. And brokering was a mediator. It mediated between parental circumstances and family disagreements and child emotional distress. In other words, it's not just the brokering, right? It's brokering that happens in a context of other negative things going on that leads to negative outcomes. Uh, so I offer it as an example uh, to think about the context when we're thinking about the child and what they're doing. The other conceptual issues that are very relevant here have to do with theories of acculturation. Um, and you know, today we talk about not just assimilation, but maintenance of one's culture. And increasingly, um, we're thinking about transnationalism. This is kind of a, a newer way of thinking. It comes from sociology. I'm a psychologist, so for me it's relatively new. Um, but it's the idea that all of us are living in a global world, and what happens to a particular individual is influenced by a number of different factors. So whether one individual gets a job, one immigrant gets a job, is not just because of this person's qualities and skills, but the global labor market that has led to the migration in the first place. And one of the things that transnational way of thinking leads us to, to do is to consider that it's not about culture A and culture B. It's not even about culture A and culture B, which is how we think about biculturalism, but it's about the idea that we live very fluidly across different cultures, three languages in the example that you just gave. Um, and, and this is the way, and the way that we have been thinking both about educating students who come from immigrant communities as well as helping them adapt in a kind of a one culture and another culture and what do you do with the two of them rather than a more fluid approach.
So these are the conceptual issues. So what uh, social, political, economic, and educational contexts are the youth entering? Increasing diversity um, in nations and schools. Um, they're often of different race and ethnicity, visibly different, uh, indistinguishable, which leads to discrimination. Um, and uh, one of the really important factors that all of you have talked about, I think every presentation I have listened to, has mentioned the uh, globalization, standardiz standardization, high stakes testing, and accountability. And this is a very important factor, of course, that impacts the teaching uh, of students who come from other countries. In the US in particular, um, teachers are now held accountable for how well their students do, and schools are held accountable for how well their students do on tests. Needless to say, immigrant students do not do very well on tests, particularly until they learn the language. And so there is an attitude towards immigrant students sometimes that is quite negative. They bring the scores down, and that has consequences for teachers. It has consequences for their salaries. It has consequences for the resources that the school receives. Um, and this is a very important context within which we live. And this leads to deficit-oriented attitudes and discri sometimes discriminatory policies. So a few things about immigrant students. So we have younger kids, as well as those who are born in the, same, in, in the country of immigrant parents, and they share a set of issues. There's also what we call late entering students. Those are students who arrive in adolescence, and they face a very different set of problems when they go to school. Uh, we have students who are literate. They were in their country on level in terms of their education. Uh, they have literacy skills, um, and sometimes they have academic schooling that is even better than that of, of kids in the country where they come. And we have students with limited or interrupted formal education. Um, maybe it was disrupted because of war. Uh, maybe they come from countries where there's no education past a certain grade level. And needless to say, students who are late entering and students with limited education are the ones who have the most difficulties in school. So I did a study, and I'm not going to describe it here, but I'm, you, know, you may want to look at it. So I've talked to many of you about it. I did a study about academic engagement of newly arriving Somali Bantu students in a US elementary school. And they were, they were arriving at a younger age but they came with interrupted, not, not only interrupted education, they had no prior education. And in fact, their native language uh, did not have a written form. Now, these, for these kids, the transition to school means not only learning English, it means learning literacy skills without supports in their native language, without parents being able to support literacy skills. And needless to say, it was very challenging, but these kids learned. They learned to read, they learned to be students, and in Chicago, they also learned Spanish because that's the language spoken there. Okay, so challenges um, they experience. You know, of course, language li literacy, uh, which is different depending on the age that they come, those who have academic backgrounds are able to transfer that knowledge into English. Um, there are behavioral issues, and for children who have not been in school or have been in school in different countries, sometimes it's learning the rules and the norms of how it is to be in school in this new place. Sometimes it's very, very different. In America, um, when you go into a high school in particular, it looks like there are no rules. Um, you know, kids are very independent, and I, to, for immigrants, sometimes it's very difficult because when they see that, they think, oh, I can do whatever I want. But actually, there are norms and rules, but they're not explicit. And it can be very hard for students to adjust to that. Uh, the, obviously, for, for children, peer relationships and school belonging is very important. And studies show that immigrant children do not feel a strong as strong a sense of school belonging uh, 
as others. Uh, they benefit a great deal from having peers from the same ethnic group as well as from um, others. The, you know, the, the other kind of conceptual framework I did not mention uh, comes from Pierre Bordeaux uh, in sociology, and there's the idea of bonding and bridging capital. Bonding capital, which is the uh, ties, the social ties you have with people who are close to you, and bridging capital is what you need uh, in order to move out of the loca your social location and be able to connect with, with those in the society. And both of those are important. Um, and uh, relationships with teachers. And finally, I want to mention that career aspirations in the new society is a very big issue. And I know many of you work with elementary school children, but for older children, this is a huge issue because they are arriving uh, late um, in their education and they have to make decisions about what are they going to do in terms of their career. And they have to make a realistic assessment about how they're going to transfer into this global economy and the way in which it's expressing itself in the local context. Uh, so I wanted to also mention that it is very challenging to teach these students and this is a paper that my colleagues did recent, recently and it's called The Kids Are Terrific, It's the Job That's Tough and it's about teachers of English language learners. And to summarize a few things that they found through an interview study of teachers was that um, Teachers came to really love the, the immigrant students. They became their advocates. Uh, now, these are teachers of special English language classes for new, newcomer students. Um, at the same time, they felt that there was a, a parallel process happening so that while the children were marginalized, the teachers were also marginalized in the school. In one school where I worked, I remember there was a list of uh, teachers, and, and teachers were listed by subject areas. And then there was a list of, called ancillary staff, and that included janitors and ELL teachers, because they were not regular classroom teachers. In fact, sometimes they don't have a classroom. They teach in the cafeteria or in a former closet. Um, and they also feel very marginal and separated from the rest of the teachers. Um, and their job is very, very stressful because particularly in early levels of English, the, the variability between those who um, don't speak English at all and those who speak English a little bit is still very large. And they have to teach a large group of students really without a lot of uh, tools uh, available to them, particularly when working with students with interrupted education who do not have the academic skills. Okay, so generally uh, what to say about approaches to working with immigrant students. So of course, you know, there, we, again, we have to think at a broader level about policies. You know, how are students placed in schools? How are teachers and schools evaluated? And I will give you an example of that in a minute. Um, teacher attitudes, what are their attitudes towards the children? Do they have um, an attitude that somehow the children come from an inferior culture or perhaps their uh, parents are uneducated? One of the things that I think everyone who has done research with immigrants, immigrant families has learned, at least in the American context, is that parents want, many of parents come to the United States because of their, to educate their children, to, to make sure that their children have a better life than they did. They are committed to their children's education. However, often the perception the teachers have is that they don't care about their children's education, perhaps because they don't come to school very much. But the point is that they, um, perhaps they don't show the ways in which they are involved in the same way that teachers expect. And finally, in terms of educational structures, there's separate newcomer schools. In New York City now, there are several high schools that are specifically designed for immigrant students. They're very interesting. My journal is about to publish a study um, of kids in that school, and, and it, it, they, 
reviews are very positive in terms of children feeling a sense of belonging, specialized supports avail available to them, and peers who are going through very similar things that they are. There are special newcomer programs within schools. Sometimes there are full day programs in a part of a school building. Sometimes maybe they're part of a day. There's pull out uh, where children leave regular classrooms for special ESL instruction. Um, and there are also specialized uh, classes with uh, language support in subject areas. And increasingly, people are talking about this idea of not only transnationalism, but translanguaging. And translanguaging is the idea that uh, multilingual speakers do not uh, cleanly speak one language or the other, that they fluidly go from one to the other. And there are a number of people who are advocating for use of this idea in the classroom and rather than prohibiting children from using their native language, encouraging them to use it with each other and with teachers as a way of supporting their education. So I want to tell you very briefly about this study um, that we're doing and I got involved in this because I found out uh, about a phenomenon happening in Miami. Um, we, uh, so late entering students that I told you about, they are at high risk for dropping out of school and school failure, we know that, because by the, they have to learn the language, uh, catch up with academic subjects, pass exams to graduate from high school in some states, and sometimes they can't do that. So schools don't want these kids, because if these children are enrolled in school, they, the school will look bad. And technically, it's not legal to turn these children away, but it's happening, and it's happening on a great scale, scale throughout the country. And these kids are then um, directed towards adult education at night, where they go to class with adults and get an equivalency diploma. Uh, this is really quite heartbreaking. And in Miami, what's happened is some of the uh, immigrant-related services organized specialized daytime programs for these children, and we're doing a study of these programs and of the children's experience. Um, there's a diversity of types of programs. Um, for the most part, uh, it's a year-long program. It happens during the day in the regular school building. Uh, they have breakfast and lunch with the other kids. Uh, they wear uniforms, wear their uniforms. Uh, there's some in Spanish for our large arrivals from Cuba and, and Venezuela uh, so that they're able to pass the exam in Spanish and there's some in English. Um, and the focus of the program is on preparing them for this test and providing them with some English language support. So our, our findings are very preliminary, but I have to say that talking to these children has been heartbreaking because all of them came to America thinking that they would be in school. They came there for their education and they do not feel like they belong in school in these programs. They cannot participate in sports. Um, they uh, cannot participate in clubs and after school activities and they understand that they're really not in a regular school, but they're preparing for an alternative. However, they're very motivated, many of them are very motivated to finish school, to go to college. Um, the issue of career aspirations is very challenging for them because they don't know how to figure that out, and they, sometimes they get some support, sometimes they don't. And I guess I just want to say that um, for me, Thinking about these programs is a real challenge because on one hand, they're providing these kids with something that they would not have otherwise. On the other hand, if you think about the system, they're making it possible, they're legitimizing essentially the idea that these 16, year, 16 to 18 year olds, it's okay for them not to be in school. And so this is a very difficult policy issue that I think we, the country needs to confront. Um, some of these programs are much more inclusive than others. Um, and um, in one of these schools, um, uh, one of the things that in Miami, I will finish with this, in Miami, uh, 
uh, in Florida actually, uh, when uh, seniors graduate from high school, they go to Disney World. Schools take them to Disney World. And uh, some of these immigrant kids went to Disney World in one of the schools. I put here some resources, and um, I'm not going to show them, but, but I wanted to share some resources with you. I don't know if you know about them, but uh, cal.org is a really important one. It's the Center for Applied Linguistics. It has a lot of information for different teaching approaches and different kinds of programs. They did a really interesting study of newcomer schools, of the kinds of newcomer centers that are organized. Um, there's a TESOL, which is an organization of teachers who teach uh, students in other languages and so forth. So thank you very much. This is the symbol of our university.